Okay, thank you very much. I um, really appreciate this invitation. It's very humbling to be here. This is a community that I've been involved with in bits and pieces, but also I kind of admire from afar continuously as well. Um, and I, I am going to say, um, kind of, I'd like to give a little bit of a frame of reference for the stuff that I'm going to be talking about. One, I like cake. I hope you do too, because there'll be a little bit of cake help. Um, and so to start with, I actually want to uh, start with a prompt. So imagine you're new to baking. So if there are any experienced bakers amongst us, this is not for you. But imagine you're new to baking and you're in a baking class. So I'm going to present to you actually four options for starting the class. Um, and I would like to ask which one of the options gives you a better sense of the final product, okay? Option one is if I just said, we're going to make a pineapple and coconut uh, sandwich cake. Okay. Option two is we're going to make a pineapple and coconut sandwich cake with these ingredients. Let's see if this will work. No, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of speak through it. The audio doesn't seem to be working, but that's okay. So we're going to make a pineapple and coconut sandwich cake using these ingredients. And by layering the coconut sponges with the Italian meringue buttercream. And option four is we're going to make a pineapple and coconut sandwich cake by layering uh, pineapple sponges with Italian lemon meringue buttercream. Which one of these gives you a better sense of the final product? I think this one, I have a feeling this, I can tell what we're going to do. This, I have a sense of where we're going to end up at. And when I saw the ingredients, given I'm not a professional baker, um, I really had no idea what that means, a sandwich cake. I kept picturing a sandwich, to be honest, like a lunch sandwich, right? Which is not really what this is. So the reason why I'm talking about this is because I think, uh, so I primarily teach people who are new to computing and statistics and they don't necessarily have the background to fill in the gaps. So we, for example, give them, our syllabi tend to have things like, today we're going to do regression, tomorrow we're going to do data visualization. Maybe get, get into even more detail, we're gonna make box <coughs> plots. But if you have never seen one, it's really, really hard to think where you're going. So when we give um, kind of exercises, even exercises with the best of intentions of like, we're going to do these actively, we're gonna collaborate with each other, Oftentimes, we as the instructors know where we're going with it. And so if I have some sort of like uh, kind of bullet point assignment that I've given them, I know where they should be going with it, but they might not. So if I start teaching with the ingredients, it might be really, really hard for them to put the pieces together because they don't necessarily know what I'm heading towards. Now, one might argue that's the, that's the beauty of learning. That's that exploration period. All right, so now those who are new to baking, how frustrating is it though? Like, don't you just wanna see a picture of what you're gonna get to? In fact, I find it really, really difficult to um, cook out of books like Joy of Cooking that's been around for years because it doesn't have any pictures. And I actually find myself looking up YouTube videos for things in like Joy of Cooking because I really wanna see what I'm heading towards, realizing that I may not get there, but I at least have an idea of what I have in mind. So. Today's talk is a little bit about um, kind of designing um, curriculum around this thought process of like, let's show them the cake first. So I'm going to be talking about five design principles here uh, for teaching primarily introductory data science, but I think that it's applicable to a lot of things. And I want to kind of start by a couple things that you might know about. One of them is backward design. And so in this like very uh, you know, well-known and commonly used uh, educational pedagogy, we say we want to set goals for educational curriculum before choosing instructional methods and forms of assessment. So it goes something like this, the standard kind of uh, visualization of this. Identify your desired results, then determine what an acceptable evidence would be for having achieved those results, and then you want to plan your experiences and instruction around this. If you're cynical, you might call this teaching to the test, but honestly, that's cynical. Like, that's just somebody being cynical as opposed to being goal-oriented. So I kind of think about this as this is analogous to travel planning. If you, you usually have an itinerary that's deliberately designed to meet your cultural goals when you're going to Paris, if it's supposed to be a romantic trip, 
there's some things you do. If it's supposed to be one focused around art, there's some things you do. You don't just go to Paris and try to see every single thing. If you've ever done that, you probably don't, are not talking to the person you traveled with before. <laughs> so it is not a purposeless tour of all the major sites in a foreign country, right? You have an itinerary. And kind of planning this itinerary, to me, is what backwards design is about. So if we kind of to take this a step further and think about our individual lessons and how we can design each of those individual lessons backwards as opposed to like a semester long curriculum designing backwards. We would identify the desired data analysis results. We would then determine the particular building blocks to get to those results. And then we plan our experiences and instruction around it. So we want to expose the students to the results and findings first. And then we give them the learning, uh, the building blocks to get there. Um, oftentimes, I see like in a lot of like lectures, even talks that I attend, but also definitely kind of teaching-oriented lectures, the instructor is very, very excited about that last point they're going to get to, and that building up of the intensity of it. They, people tend to say things like, and in a minute, I'll tell you. Well, in a minute, the student might be sleeping. So if you have something really good to say, just say it now. So this is kind of um, you know, a little bit of a defensive strategy, maybe, because my students do, unfortunately, sometimes fall asleep. But I was a student who fell asleep sometimes. You, know, you never know what they're up to. Um, so I think it's important to kind of give them this ahead of time, the final results. And hopefully, that is going to be the thing that draws them into thinking, OK, I want to learn how to get there myself as well. Um, the context of uh, what I'm going to be talking about is an introductory data science course that assumes no background. And um, when I say no background, I often say no background in statistics and no background in computing. And just this morning, I was responding to an email from uh, the head of school at the new institution I'm at saying, well, what about math? No, just we're assuming nothing, but it is a college level course. So I'm assuming a little bit that this is not the first quantitative reasoning experience these students are exposed to, but we're not necessarily looking for any sort of mathematical background in terms of calculus or algebra or anything either. Um, it focuses on exploratory data analysis, modeling, um, inference and modern computing, which is not necessarily the order in which you would see things in a traditional introductory statistics course. I think inference would tend to come first in a very traditional introductory statistics course. This particular course uses R as a statistical programming language, so the examples I'm going to be giving will be around R. If you're a user of a different language, I think there's bits and pieces that are relatable, but the code itself won't necessarily transfer. It requires reproducibility, and when I say it requires reproducibility, it means we actually carve out class time to talk about reproducibility and give the students the tools to do data analysis reproducibly, and we leverage the fact that they don't have any other background. So no one tells me, yeah, but I tend to do my work this way. They don't. They don't have another way they're doing the work. So they are actually all working in these um, our markdown documents that are by nature reproducible. And it's easy to maintain that ecosystem in the course, given that it's an introductory course. We're not talking about things that require a lot of computational efficiency sorts of things, where these simpler tools for reproducibility tend to present some challenges. We tackle those at a later point in the curriculum. And it emphasizes collaboration and effective communication. And that doesn't mean we just have a final project at the end where we tell people to get in groups and do that at the most stressful time of their semester. We actually do group work all throughout, including peer evaluations and code review as well. So by the time the final project comes around, they know each other in that team. And so they have, they have kind of worked out the kinks of their workflows. They kind of know each other's schedules, so when we give them a bigger assignment to work on, it would be foolish of me to say everything works perfectly, but often I would be very comfortable saying that for majority of the groups, they have a system they have going, so we don't have to worry about kind of difficulties that come up from human interaction at that point. Um, I also want to introduce you to um, this report. It is the guidelines for assessment in introductory statistics education. So this is a report that the American Statistical Association publishes, um, not with set any sort of regularity, but it's been more often lately because the landscape of statistics education is changing more rapidly. And from the latest report in 2016, there's a new one that's being worked on right now, but not out yet. From the latest report in 2016, these were the six points. And I want to kind of show you my annotated reading of this. So the first thing is teach statistical thinking. 
And in my opinion, statistical thinking is not a commonly used subset of tests and intervals and producing them with hand calculations, which tends to be a lot of what we see in intro stack courses where we teach students, here's a t-test, here's a chi-square test, and this is how you do it by hand. Um, it says, investigate and explore relationships among many variables. This is often a concept that tended to be uh, reserved until a second course in statistics where we did modeling. But if you're thinking about many variables, at some point you're going to have to think about at least building multiple uh, multivariate visualizations, even if not models. And there, the pen and paper thing breaks apart. You need to use comp computing. Um, it says use technology. It doesn't say use technology that is only applicable in the intro course or that doesn't follow good science principles. There's fantastic work that's done in terms of like different click and drag uh, kind of interfaces for doing data analysis. And I think those are good, but they don't tend to grow with the students. So if we're thinking that we want to be raising students who one day are going to be scientists and researchers, would it be bad for me to say who may not need the first carpentry lesson maybe, but may start contributing at a higher level, then we need to start with them early. Um, and lastly, it says analyze data. And if you've ever analyzed data, it is not just inference and modeling. You have to import it, you have to clean it, you have to prepare it, you have to explore it, you have to visualize it. All these surveys about what people do as data analysts often tell us that these other bits take up about 80 to 90 percent of their time. So it's really unrealistic for us to just give these data sets on a platter to our students at the beginning and give them the misconception that this is how data lives in the wild. So we want to start with actually a realistic experience of what data analysis looks like. So the course that um, this is going to be that I'm talking about is a course I've taught at Duke University and soon in the fall in the University of Edinburgh. And this is how the kind of the units are laid out. So we start actually with data visualization. Um, and this is an important time for us to both kind of teach them bits and pieces of R in the context of data visualization. Initially not as a programming language, but as a tool for making data visualizations. Um, and as a statistician, I enjoy doing the, in this unit touching on certain concepts that are hard to learn, like uh, Simpson's paradox, for example, and confounding variables and visualizing their effect to teach that to students. And we also teach them kind of the basics of the workflow at that point. So they use R in R Studio. They're doing their work in our markdown documents, and they use a little bit of simple Git to work with it. So they actually turn in their assignments, not in a learning management system, but as GitHub repositories that we set up for them. Then we move on to data wrangling, and you'll see that the arrows keep going back, because when you wrangle the data and you do something to it, you want to visualize it to make sure you've done the right thing, or at least you've done the thing you intended to do. So here we talk about what is tidy data, what are data frames versus summary tables. Um, we talk a little bit about recoding and transformation, and we talk also about um, where to get data from. One of the sources is the web, so we do we end this unit with an uh, exercise on web scraping, which is the first time we actually start more introducing more programming elements like functions, because there's nothing m more frustrating than having to hit different websites. So code that iterates over them is something that students become interested in. And then in the next unit, when we start talking about inference, we build on that idea of iteration. So the idea of iteration is initially introduced as a way to solve a web scraping problem. And then we say, hey, resampling is also something that's going to require the same type of iteration in terms of how you're writing the code, uh, but addressing a very different challenge. So in the next unit, uh, we start uh, their introduction to statistics from a modeling perspective. So they're building and selecting models, visualizing some interactions. We do a little bit of prediction and model validation, but just a little bit, just to give them a taste of what machine learning things might start feeling like down the line if they were to take another course. And we do a statistical inference from a simulation-based perspective. So not getting into the details of the theory, assuming that if they're interested in being a statistician, they necessarily will have to take a mathematical statistics course that I think will have a much more elegant exposure there for the theory. But here we're kind of giving them tools for building um, kind of bootstrap based confidence intervals and stuff. And finally, um, the last couple of weeks of class while students are working on um, their um, 
projects, um, we do a more formal model on data science ethics. We start talking about this early on, especially when we first introduce uh, web scraping, but we do a more formal unit on things like algorithmic bias and stuff where we're just, it's a lecture where I'm giving them a lot of examples and having them discuss things as opposed to implement things at this point. Um, we do, and then the rest of it, honestly, the way I've taught this over the last few years is whatever I wanted to learn during that time. So we do some shiny. Uh, students really like seeing the interactivity thing and being able to build on that. Until last year, I hadn't really done any text analysis. Best way to get yourself to do something, put it on your syllabus. That day comes and you have to learn it. So that's how I learned a little bit of text analysis. And I am a Bayesian at heart, so I do a little bit of a discrete example of a Bayesian inference uh, decision theory problem for them, just to show them that we've done other types of like decision making. There are other ways, and I think these are interesting things to learn about. We definitely won't have time to implement these now, but I encourage you to take another course. Um, but a lot, all of these things don't necessarily come with an assignment attached to them, since the students are working on their projects at that time. So. Five design principles. The first one is start with cake. I have a toddler, I would never say that to him, but I'm saying it too. Start with cake. <laughs> so, which of the following is more likely to be motivating for a wide range of students? Option one is, today is the day one of learning R. Let's declare the following variables and think about what types they are. And option two is to say, open today's demo project, knit the R Markdown document we gave you, look at this one figure, not the code, just look at the figure for the time being, and then discuss with your neighbors what it is about. So the data set that I use on the first day of class is voting patterns in the United Nations uh, General Assembly over the years on these six issues. Um, I'm originally from Turkey. I lived in the US, so this is probably the image I'll use when I'm teaching in the UK now. Um, and so we ask students to talk about these a little bit. It is a general interest topic, and maybe each of the students may not be interested in all six of these frames, but they tend to know something about something. At least, honestly, the Palestinian conflict is something they've heard about, and they tend to think, oh, I'm not too surprised US and Turkey disagree on this matter, for example. So the data follows their intuition there, and then we tell them, you're going to do your first programming assignment before we teach you anything. Change Turkey to a different country, and plot again, and then use that as an opportunity to talk to the next person about why you chose that country. I think this is more motivating in general. Now that doesn't mean the other panel is unimportant, it just means it's not necessarily motivating on the first day of class to a group of students who have no exposure to programming previously. But with great examples does come a great amount of code. So this so there we tell the students, we're going to focus on the task at hand. We're giving you an R Markdown document that has the code that generates this. And what we're asking you to do is to change Turkey to a different country and plot again. That's it. So this is all the code that it takes to produce that plot. And we assure them that within three weeks or four weeks, I think, that they could write this sort of code from scratch. But for now, if I wanted to change Turkey, what should I touch? This is, they're very good at identifying that must be the row you're going to touch. And really, let's put our blinders on, just focus on this one character string, change it to a different country, and push the one button to knit the document again. And at that point, then it gives them an opportunity to talk to the person next to them as to why they chose those com that country. Maybe it's a bit of an icebreaker. Sometimes they're surprised at the results, sometimes they're not. Um, but then, at the end of that day, we've actually told them, well, you've done your first programming bit without me teaching you any sort of programming. So this is doable. So why is cake visualization? <laughs> um, I think it's more likely for students to have some intuition coming in. Uh, kind of reading plots is something people tend to do nowadays at this point, reading the newspaper even. Um, it's also stuff, graphs are things that a lot of students have been exposed to earlier on in their schooling, even if they haven't built them using a computer. Um, and I think it's easier for students to catch their own mistakes. If you, they actually make a code and, uh, error, it might be easier to catch their mistakes than if they're doing something like data wrangling, when some things might be transformed silently behind the scenes, but they may not ever see it. If you don't follow this uh, Twitter account, I recommend it. It's called Accidental Art, and people tweet their accidental arts. <laughs> this is what mistakes can look like. They can be fun, but you can also catch that, you know, this plot there is probably not what you intended to do. <laughs> and lastly, I mean, 
who doesn't like a good piece of cake, right? People like good visualization, so if you teach them with the tools, that will generate at least a visualization that looks like that was produced in this decade, visualization that might look like it is the type of thing they might see in the New York Times or the Guardian, it's quite empowering to be able to get there. Um, a couple of examples from other curriculum that I personally very much admire and I think have done an incredible job getting this sort of material out into like huge, huge audiences. There are still bits of it that are surprising to me. So this is from uh, the Microsoft Professional Program Certificate in Data Science on edX. They get to graphics in section seven, so you have to go through a lot of stuff before you get to visualization. This example is from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Specialization. Um, they have you know, exposed millions of millions of students to data science topics and programming in R and have done a great job doing it. But the first time visualization comes up actually is an exploratory data analysis after you've done even things like loops and debugging. Now I think that these ultimately have worked because these particular courses that are offered online have an audience that is different than the one I tend to work with in a university setting. These are people choosing to sign up and give up their personal time somehow for their own professional development, knowing that this is the type of thing I want to or need to learn to get ahead in life. This is very different than your average first year college student who signs up for a course because it sounds interesting, but they still have a whole lot of kind of learning to do before really understanding um, what exactly it is that they want to do and whether what you're teaching them will actually ultimately be relevant for their careers or not. So I'm not saying that this sort of curriculum design is wrong, but I think it's really important to keep in mind who your audience is when you're doing your curriculum design. Number two is Cherish Day One. So which of the following is more likely to be welcoming for a wide range of students? Option one is we're gonna install R, our studio, some packages, load these packages and install Git. Uh, and option two is we're going to go to some server-based solution, could be our studio cloud, could be something else, log in with something like your Google account, and start coding. I'm going to guess that actually if we were to try panel one here right now, we still might fail to do it within the time I have allotted for this talk. And y'all are not completely new to this stuff, right? It's really, really hard, and I think it can be really discouraging to get stuck in the software installation step. So I'm a huge believer in a cloud-based solution to getting people started. That doesn't mean they'll never install things. That doesn't mean installation isn't important. It just means that'll come later. Um, so method of delivery and your medium of interaction really does matter. So in my course, the way we solve this is when it's time to do some coding, they go to their browser, not another app on their computer. They authenticate through some sort of email address, so either that's their university email, if you've set up such a thing to work, um, we're working on setting that up at the university now that I'm in, or it could be something like RStudio Cloud where they use maybe Google to do that and follow up. They land into an RStudio space, and the important thing about that is that is not the RStudio you would have downloaded on your computer today. It is one I prepared for them, right? I already baked the cake a little bit. I put in our markdown document that I know works. I have packages pre-installed. Git is working on the back end. Tech is installed if you want to get a PDF output. These are not unchallenging things. Um, and they open this one R markdown document that has some code and some scaffolding built into it. So this is what that first document looks like on the first day of class. Gives them a little bit of information about that UN votes document mm -hmm. and that ultimate um, figure that we saw earlier. And then we basically come back to this example over that data visualization unit and say, hey, now we know how to do those lines five through eight of that code. And now we've learned a little bit more. Number three is skip baby steps, and um, this might sound counterintuitive, but bear with me. So, which of the following is more likely to inspire students to want to learn more? Number one would be to create a simple bar graph. So here we've looked at that same data and made a bar graph of the number of resolutions that had an amendment or not. And option two is that visualization that we looked at earlier. I think that this is going to be a better way to kind of get started. We often tend to start with the simpler example because 
we don't want to end up here, okay? So non-trivial examples can be very motivating, but you can't do this to your students. So you gotta go a little bit gentler, so maybe use scaffold and layer, and here I will highlight um, there, there are many reasons why I use the plotting system. I use ggplot2, but one of the best reasons for it, I think, from a learning perspective, is this idea of layering. And the fact that you can actually teach the code layer by layer and visually see what is happening. So we can start with plotting just uh, data. So here, um, oh, this is always the case with the resolution. There's a gray blob there that actually is your canvas. So imagine putting on your hat and like, you know, having your paintbrushes. We have an empty canvas, then we add our axes to it. So now we're mapping the variables, and at this point, we can do a little bit of just-in-time teaching. So why do we have these parentheses? What is happening here? So we can talk a little bit about R is constructed as functions and arguments. Functions often tend to be a verb. The parentheses that enclose what that verb should be applied to. Here's what a data frame looks like that we're plotting. So we can actually see what the variable names and how they kind of correspond to what we've written in the code in terms of year and percent yes. And then we actually build our plot layer by layer, talking through what's happening at every single layer. I kind of like that the first time you actually do a smooth um, kind of curve and using ggplot, it will give you the standard error around it because that's something we're actually going to hit on later on in the class, this idea of uncertainty. But we also tell them we can for the time being simplify things and turn that off and then we'll come back to it later. So it allows me to do a little bit of foreshadowing. So we actually build this up layer by layer, showing them at each step what's happening. And I think that vi the visual cues are really, really helpful. So yes, you actually are taking baby steps, so that skip the baby steps thing is not 100% honest. But what I mean is that we don't have to wade through things that may not be motivating for a while. We might be able to break down something that is a bit more of a mo motivating ex uh, example into its own baby steps. Number four is hide the veggies. This also, I'm a pro at nowadays. <laughs> um, so, which of the following is more likely to be interesting for a wide range of students? Option one is to say today we're going to do some web scraping and the tools we're going to use are in a package called Arvest and regular expressions. And option two is to say today we're going to go to this website which has information on um, campaign donations for the voting districts in North Carolina, so this is a Duke example that I used, and we're going to then make a spatial plot based off of that, based off of the uh, donations, and then we're going to do this in a way that's easy to replicate for another state because your homework is going to be to do it for another state. I'm gonna go with this one. And if anyone claims that they love regular expressions, okay, <laughs> walk away. <laughs> no, no, so, Obviously incredibly important, but if you've never heard of the word regular expression, it's not that. And then people get into the hall, like how do you pronounce it, whatever. This is not going to be something that makes people want to stick around and learn more, I think. But to say we're going to make a map based off of that table might potentially be it. But how do we do this? So students are going to encounter a lot of challenges going from that HTML table to that spatial map that I was showing. So the idea is to let that happen, but let that happen in a safe and space where you can actually walk them through those challenges, and then we provide a solution. So as an example, the way I would break this lesson up is, initially, we start with a mini lesson, like a lecture bit, on web scraping essentials. So I introduce them, Arbus, and give them one example of how to get a table from a website into R. And then we ask them to simply scrape this one table of that one voting district in North Carolina uh, into a data frame with two rows. And this is not happening on the first day of class, so they already know what a data frame is. And then we tell them, okay, now that you see this data frame, what other information do we need represented as variables in the data for the desired facet? So, this is when students are actually going to start telling you, well, I need to know if someone's a challenger or an incumbent, but that seems to be stuck as a text string 
in that first column, I need a way of getting that out of there. And also whether people are Democrat or Republican are also stuck in that first column as within that text string. So this is when we say, well, there's this awesome thing you can use called a regular expression. And we can extract these things out into their own columns. And by now, you know, when things are in a column, we know how to put them in facets or we know how to color by them. So we motivate the need for a regular expression and teach them just enough to kind of get around it. And lastly, leverage the ecosystem. So um, here I want to give the example of a package that we've built to kind of be able to keep teaching using this pedagogical uh, tool. And the example I'm going to use is one I like showing at the end of, uh, towards the end of a semester when we're doing a little bit of modeling. Is This is a data set from a um, study on gender bias in um, student evaluations uh, from University of uh, Texas, Austin. So each of these is a faculty member. And interestingly, not only did they collect the student evaluations, they selected six students to rate the beauty of these professors and then actually average them. So we actually can use that score as well. Um, and so here, for example, what we would do is might be something like, let's try to estimate the difference between the male and female um, evaluation scoring. So this is how you would do this using base R. So we're trying to build a confidence interval. But the function we would use is a t dot test that happens to have the confidence interval somewhere in its output. Or this is the other option that I'm going to present. This is a package we've built to kind of ad address this issue. So there's a lot more code in that second panel, but let me pitch to you as to why that might actually be easier to wait for for students, or at least more intuitive. So in the first one, as I said, we're making a confidence interval, but you have to use a function called test, and then you have to read through everything. You probably need to know who Welch is, which you probably haven't introduced in your class, and then they need to kind of figure out where to go from there. So this particular package called infer actually builds on the tidyverse design framework that the students are exposed to in the class up until this point. Um, and so what we do is we start with a data set, we um, specify a model, we then generate bootstrap samples, and then we calculate for each of these samples a difference in means between the males and females. And finally, we use a tool that they already know for data summarization from the dplyr package to create the confidence interval, and it also spits out a visualization for them as well. So this was a tool that didn't exist prior to kind of, while well, we were kind of initially designing this curriculum, and it was a really fun opportunity to build something that actually might help this thing. So I think that if there's an ecosystem you're teaching in, sometimes you might want to kind of bring in your software design chops and see if you want to build something that might help you solve the problem as well. So let's to kind of our too long didn't listen is these are the five design principles that I would uh, suggest and very quickly I have three goals with this course to make everything open to make things validated which is very challenging and to make things scalable in terms of openness all the materials for this course are at datasciencebox.org and I'm kind of adding to it this summer as I'm kind of redesigning it for a different length and for a different scale um, in terms of validated, one of the things that I've worked on with my undergraduate student last summer was looking at open-ended student projects from the past to see how learning with the tidyverse, uh, within the tidyverse framework tends to be associated with what students do with what they learn in their open-ended projects. So we've seen things like in terms of creativity, what they do with their um, with the open-ended uh, project that we've given them, they tend to score a bit higher if they've learned with the tidyverse. Uh, we've also seen things like the depth of the analysis tends to be a little bit higher. And they definitely, this is the one where the, the uh, difference is more definite, that multivariate visualizations, the tidyverse framework makes it a lot easier and that's one of the kind of the gaze guidelines that we're seeing a lot more students actually tackle those when taught with that. Um, this was a retrospective study and my goal in the next coming years is going to be do more experimental work around this as opposed to looking at this retrospectively. Scalable, I don't know. So if you have any ideas, <laughs> I'd be very interested. A few things I'm working on right now are things like more formative assessments, automated feedback, which is a lot harder, I think, in a data science course and a CS 101 course, and some peer review work that I'm working on with the student over the summer. But this is a really hard problem to tackle for a course like this. Um, so if you have ideas, I'm open to them. 
And so let them eat cake first. You can tell them all about the ingredients later. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great talk. I'm also in the position of teaching undergrads quite a lot of things that, that I want to maybe incorporate some of your ideas. But in terms of the learners that we are mostly serving as a carpenters community, which are non undergrads but most of them are graduate students, would you argue for the same approach in terms of cake? An example is that we do have two Python lessons. One of them is showing some cake first, but with a data set that I don't think many people understand. It's something about inflammation and gives a beautiful plot. I don't think anybody can explain what that plot is. First is the Gapminder lesson, which is a data set which is much more understandable, but it does the uh, scaffolding and bit by bit approach first. So, what would, would be your advice in terms of our lessons? Yeah, so I think, um, I think, right, you. I said start with the cake, but it depends on like what that tastes like. I think some of the examples I've seen in terms of, if it's hard to have an intuition around that visualization that you're seeing, I think that would be really hard. So the reason why I, cho I choose the UN votes example, for example, is that maybe you're a biology student, maybe you're a physics student, but you might know a little bit about those issues. So I think unless you know exactly what background and interest of uh, applied interest of people you're teaching to i think it's better to use something like gapminder i think is a good example for that um, i think you still can do the let's show them the visualization first so this can be literally just restructuring of an hour-long lesson where instead of saying this is how ggplot works or whatever plotting system you're using, saying this is what we're going to do. In about 50 minutes, we're going to get to this and let's break things up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the axes. Let's talk a little bit about the colors and stuff like that. And just bringing it uh, back up, to kind of showing them the final result at the beginning, but pro potentially not changing a whole lot of what you're teaching otherwise, just reorganizing the lesson content within it. I think that that would be more motivating, uh, regardless of whether you're teaching undergraduates or people later in their career. Um, just thank you very much for an absolutely wonderful talk. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think that my, my uh, I like infrastructure and things like that, and that involves people too. Um, and I like the idea that you can put stuff in a cloud and people spin it up, but I train in areas where the internet isn't really that available. So one of the things that I find very kind of anxious when you start training is has everybody got the right stuff available? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be really interested, in not, uh, and also from, from your perspective, how we try and solve that issue, because that for me is one of those things that just keeps coming up. You can use the cloud and it's available, but actually then trying to get those bits, the bits of the cake we need to actually just even yeah. start the course with people can be an obstacle. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think this is a very, very important question. And um, and I don't have a whole lot of answers for it, but here is kind of a distillation of my thoughts around it. So it, if there is no internet access, I think that makes it really difficult. So that, that I'm not necessarily sure how to get around that topic, but one of the things I find starting with cloud resources to be is actually democratizing is that it doesn't matter how old your student's computer is. It doesn't matter whether they have a Mac where things tend to work a little bit more easily or if they have a seven-year-old Dell computer. And especially actually when you go on to doing things that require a bit more computational efficiency, you see a huge difference in what people's, how much they pay for their computer and how quick their code is running. And I think that's completely unfair. Now, I will say that within the structure that I am teaching in currently, the way I'm trying to push this agenda is talking up as opposed to down and saying, no, you people need to dig into your pockets and put the resources, the cloud resources in, 
don't build computer labs in class. Nobody wants to get out of their pajamas to go to class anyway. But let's try to get something closer to where we can have these experiences. We can assume that maybe every student, at least if they're enrolled at a university, can have access to these computing resources. And the cost is lower that way in terms of being able to reach. But obviously, I'm speaking now in terms of, all right, we're going to provide things for our enrolled students where people tend to dig into their pockets a bit more easily than other like community uh, resource building type of stuff. But I do think that if we are able to make the case that for learning, and for kind of equal learning opportunities for all, being able to invest in resources like this would be helpful. Um, I think that might that, that means doing a little bit of like lobbying and then also knowing a lot about what sort of computational infrastructure would give you the minimum viable product to be able to run you know these particular lessons that you tend to teach and, uh, and stuff. So, it, it does end up with a lot of emails and talking to people, but once you've convinced them and once they see the students are doing well and are learning from it, um, it helps. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I love the talk. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is the, I just looked up to get it right, the not invented here to the syndrome. So you've made all of this curriculum available and it would be a dream, I think, for probably most of the people in this room if other people just used it and used it to teach their undergrads and taught them all of these cool things and following all of the principles that you just said. Have you had any experience or have you, do you have any thoughts around like resistance to other instructors using your materials because it will be perceived negatively that they haven't created the materials themselves? Um, so, you know, I, my, some of my experience with this actually is from days I tried to forget where I had more administrative roles and actually read people's student evaluations and students comment on that stuff, which is like crazy to me. So what, like, the instructor attributed where they got their stuff from, which is the right thing they should be doing, and you're gonna use that to criticize them? That seems crazy to me. But I do know that, um, I do know of people who use this curriculum, and some actually who take it in full, and then over time maybe make it their own, and some who actually take bits and pieces of it. Um, I have been, so while I have left, like this year I'm not teaching at Duke, last year I work with a faculty member who will continue to teach this course there, and in her first time she kind of did it the same way I did, as she was getting used to things, and then I know she's putting her own touch on things now. Um, the, the license that it's released under actually allows people to not have to put every sing on every single one of their slides where the stuff comes from, just acknowledging it once helps. And turns out students never read that far down the curriculum, so it doesn't matter. Um, so I think, I think it does, there is such an effect, but the best way that I've seen in terms of overcoming that, and I have when I have borrowed stuff from other people, is doing it in bits and pieces as opposed to a whole. So when I put together the data science in a box, I was actually surprised to hear of people who do use it in its entirety. The reason why it exists in its entirety is because I think that's the best way to be able to judge for an instructor what this material is about. I find it really hard when I find some cool example of a lesson online, but I have no idea what curriculum it fits in. Does it come in week three, week eight? These are really different things. I may not need the rest of that curriculum, but it's really helpful to see it all in one place. So that's why it's offered on that platter with the assumption that people actually will take bits and pieces of it. And I think then there's a lot less resistance if you are just taking bits and pieces. <laughs> 